Hello everyone, and welcome to my General Hospital News YouTube channel. I hope everyone is having a wonderful day. Before we begin, please hit the subscribers button and give this video a thumbs up. Finn and Chase arrived at Finn's apartment to find Gregory splayed out on the sofa, his nose and mouth covered with an oxygen mask. Violet implored her father, in tears, to assist her grandfather. Finn dashed to check on Gregory, who was awake but unable to move. Chase summoned paramedics, while Finn gently asked Violet what had happened. Violet claimed that she and Gregory were playing a game when Gregory began to have trouble breathing. Violet had retrieved the portable ventilator for her grandfather and placed it on him. Finn soon determined that his father was not in agony by having Gregory blink once for yes and twice for no. Finn commended Violet for assisting her grandfather. Chase decided to carry Violet to her bedroom, where she promptly fell asleep, fatigued. When Chase returned to the living room, Finn informed his father that the paramedics were on their way, and he encouraged Gregory to rest. We've got you, Finn vowed. Chase pondered what he should do about the wedding when Gregory's eyes closed, since he couldn't imagine himself marrying while their father was disabled and may be hospitalized. Finn informed Chase that the decision would be up to Chase and Brooke Lynn. Finn could only concentrate on getting Gregory assistance and soothing Violet. Shortly after the paramedics arrived, Gregory gradually regained sensation in his legs. Finn urged Gregory to go to the hospital for a checkup, but Gregory declined because the medical crisis had passed. Violet awoke after everyone had departed and dashed outside to check on her grandfather. She returned to bed after being convinced that he was well. Gregory swore not to let something like that happen again after seeing Violet's terror in her eyes. Finn kindly recommended they discuss it in the morning. Brooke Lynn, Lois, and Tracy returned home from the party. Everyone was upbeat, and Brooke Lynn thanked her mother for the memorable event, saying it had been a wonderful night. Anything for my girl, Lois exclaimed with delight. Tracy concurred that it had been a good night. But some of your friends can't hold their liquor, Tracy mocked. Not like you, ha, huh, Grandma. Brooke Lynn inquired with a knowing grin. Brooke Lynn stated that she wanted to call Chase to tell him about her night, but she didn't want to bother him if he was still celebrating with his friends or wake him up if he was asleep at home. Instead, Brooke Lynn went to change into pajamas and robes, while Lois got a drink and worked on the wedding seating arrangement. When Brooke Lynn returned, Lois recounted how she had altered things to keep the two Cerullo women apart. Their chat became serious when Lois admitted that if she could have chosen the ideal husband for Brooke Lynn, she would have chosen someone exactly like Chase. Brooke Lynn hugged her mother and expressed her love. Tracy entered a few minutes later, flipping through images on her phone from earlier that evening. Tracy was dressed for bed, with her hair down, causing Brooke Lynn to question why her grandma was still awake. Tracy indicated that she needed something to hydrate herself with, so she pondered between getting a cup of warm milk to help her sleep and having a nightcap of schnapps. Brooke Lynn reminded Tracy that alcohol is not hydrating. Just then, Lois' phone vibrated with a notice. Chase texted Lois to let Brooke Lynn know he was on his way over. Brooke Lynn claimed that she had left her phone in the bedroom, but she suspected something was amiss when Chase came over at that late hour. Chase arrived shortly after and promptly informed everyone about Gregory's medical situation. Brooke Lynn promised to phone the florist and caterer in the morning to discuss their choices if they wanted to cancel the wedding. Tracy opposed because she believed Gregory would do all in his ability to officiate the wedding. Gregory called Tracy just on cue. Gregory assured Tracy that he was fine, but he revealed that he had phoned her to ensure that Chase and Brooke Lynn did not cancel their wedding or seek a replacement efficient. Gregory refused to let his illness spoil their plans, vowing to be fine for the wedding, even if it kills me. Tracy grinned when relaying Gregory's message. Gregory mentioned that if necessary, Tracy might assist him at the wedding. Chase and Brooke Lynn agreed to ahead with their wedding. Jordan threw her axe at the board and landed closer Smiled to the target triumphantly as she joined Drew at the table. When Jordan stated that axe throwing was invented in Canada by a group of friends who had been drinking and bet each other on who could throw an axe the best, 
He admitted that it sounded utterly made up. Drew took out his phone to prove it was true. Jordan viewed Scout's photo on his phone and revealed that she wished Molly and TJ had a girl so she could buy her granddaughter a ridiculous number of clothes. Drew believed Jordan was too young to become a grandma. Jordan, flattered, revealed that she had a better time than she had anticipated. Drew admitted that he felt the same way. They discussed Chase and Brooke Lynn, and both felt that the happy pair was perfect for each other. I genuinely appreciate the reminder of the excitement that happens in a relationship before somebody gets their heart broken, Drew went on to say. Jordan chuckled, since he had been about to offer something pleasant. Jordan was convinced that Drew would arrive eventually. Drew laughed and offered to lead Jordan outside. Anna and Dex sipped their drinks at an adjacent table, chatting about the evening's happenings. Dex appreciated Chase's invitation, but he recognized it might have been a mistake to go because several police officers had given him a cold response. Anna inquired whether Dex had second thoughts about joining the police academy. He assured her that if admitted, he would work and study hard till graduation. However, he was aware that certain police officers did not want him to join their ranks since they disliked him for working with Sonny. The other cops are wondering what my angle is here, Dexter added. Dex mentioned that he had been in a similar scenario with Sonny, and he didn't want to place himself back in a position where he was continuously suspected and undermined by those around him. Got it, Anna said. She emphasized that trust was crucial on the force because a police officer's life depended on their partner. So you agree this is going to be a problem? Dex asked. He was curious whether she had changed her mind about him joining the police force. Anna stated that she had been in Dex's position and had had to prove that she shared her fellow officer's desire to protect and serve. Anna was convinced that Dex could do the same and would be successful at winning people over. Anna admitted that she had initially wanted Dex to work for her because he was familiar with Sonny and his organization, but she had since been impressed by Dex's dedication. Anna reassured Dex that he was a nice man and would make an excellent officer. Dex thanked Anna for her support, but she reminded him that he would still have to deal with Detective Bennett at the police academy. Dex assured her he would not back down. Anna was pleased and informed Dex that he was about to embark on an important mission because society required police officers to maintain cities safe and livable. Anna said that there would always be bullies, but Dex should not let them get to him. Dex agreed to do his best. Sam approached Dant in another area of the facility and apologized for his tardiness. As she sat down, she told him about Danny sneaking out to see Jason. Dant understood Sam's displeasure, but he suggested she take a deep breath. Sam muttered that Jason appeared to be a good guy, but he had broken her heart twice by disappearing from her life. She admitted that the first time was not Jason's choice, but the same could not be said for the second. Sam was frustrated by Jason's lack of explanation and how his decisions would affect Danny. He would be devastated if Jason disappeared again, he stated. Dant acknowledged that the situation was challenging, but he also stated that Danny should not feel guilty about wanting to establish a relationship with his father. That's not what I am doing, am I? Sam asked. Sam admitted that Danny had been experiencing troubles before Jason returned, but she was concerned that Danny would perceive Jason as someone to complain to about the rules Sam had enforced. Dante wondered whether Sam felt Jason would promote that kind of behavior. All I know is that it's too dangerous for Danny to be around his father right now, he stated. She said that she and Jason had broken up due to the danger that had surrounding Jason. Sam was determined to keep her children physically and emotionally safe, and she refused to let the danger that had pursued Jason back into their house and lives. Dant talked about his own youth without a father and how he wanted to know his father and have him be proud of him. Sam was relieved that Dant and Sonny had made up for lost time, but she believed their circumstances were different. Thanks for watching if you like this video, so please don't forget to subscribe my channel and don't miss any update.